Hello right. and welcome everyone. My name is Deb Swanson. I'm the host for this session. And it's a, it's a great honor to introduce our next presenter. Um, he's a professor and lead faculty for the Forbes School of Business and Technology. He's also very active in that um, Ashford organization and the communities around here. So welcome Dr. William Woods. And his presentation is entitled Using Emotional Intelligence and Needs Theory to develop service projects. The floor is yours, Dr. Woods. Thank you very much, Ms. Swanson. Uh, welcome to you, um, our guest today. And you know, when I think about service projects, often I think about goals like let's gather 2,000 pounds of food or, or let's serve 100 people or let's have 100 hours, you know, goals and objectives of what you want to see happen in a service project in order to be able to measure the success of the particular service project. Well, I want to refocus that today and offer you an alternative to uh, goals and objectives. And this one would be having some projects that can focus on emotions, needs, and relationships. Because after all, often service projects are focused on individuals and they're also focused on groups and that's the people element that's involved in the project. Well, by doing this, one of the things I wanna do is uh, first give you some components of how I operate in uh, building service projects. Uh, first one, Robert uh, Pluchik. I, I think this is really, really important. And he recognized that there was eight emotions. He, he grouped them into four pairs of popular or polar opposites, you know, joy and sadness. And when you think about that, and then you pair that with some other uh, emotions like anger and fear or trust and distrust, surprise and anticipation. What he says about those things, which is very, very important is that those emotions are hardwired in us. And when you think about, you know, like being a little child or even being a baby, you all of a sudden you start to see that babies have emotions right from the beginning. And it doesn't take much to look at a baby's face and, you know, all of a sudden you smile at the baby and the baby smiles back at you. And then after a while, they take that same smile and smile at someone else and they elicit a smile back from another person. But see, that's part of that emotionally hardwired individual that's developing in society. The next thing I want to focus on is um, the three uh, different components of um, Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence. And what, when you look at Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence, it's very important, one, to know your own emotions. How are you hardwired? When you get in various situations, how do you think, how do you act, and what does it mean? And so, you know, for us, when you think about knowing your own emotions, there's a lot of people who are just like you, a lot of people who are just like me. And you can either comfort them or you can push their buttons. And every time that you comfort them, you get emotional response. And every time that you push their buttons, you're gonna get emotional response. Well, one of the things that, you know, uh, Goldman uh, recommends is that we learn how to manage our own emotions so that we end up being emotionally mature and managing our own emotions. Yeah, sometimes you think, okay, okay, I'm gonna squash one of my emotions down and hold it back. And then, you know, sometimes you'll hear about, well, if, if you're gonna hold back on your emotions, then that has a future uh, aspect to it where we might explode. Well, not actually when you're managing your emotions because you're starting to understand yourself and starting to understand how you think. Well, while you start to understand yourself, it helps you with understanding others also. And so one of the things that you can do with emotional intelligence is, is gear how you motivate yourself. So like if you're creating a service project, why are you creating the ser service project? What emotional need in yourself does it satisfy? And so now you can either use that in a negative aspect Way or you can use it in a positive way. So if you use it in a positive way, you never use motivation to manipulate another person. You never use motivation just to get what you want, regardless of what other people need. And the other thing is, uh, 
recognizing emotions in others. Now, this is really, really important because no matter where you go, you are always going to deal with some person that's an emotional person. Now, I'm not saying that in a bad sense. I'm saying we're all, we all have our emotions. We're all hired, hardwired with our emotions. And so therefore, knowing that everyone that you come across has their emotions, well, then you can anticipate according to the different situations that certain emotions are going to arise. And with that being the case, you can manage your own emotions so that you don't give too much of a response, but you give a response that's right for the situation. The other thing that you hear emotions is uh, use them to build relationships or handle your relationships so, so that there'll be healthy relationships. And see, when we're thinking about relationships, this is where we're actually getting into what I'm talking about and building service projects that are relationship oriented. So in thinking about the emotions and thinking about needs, I use a couple of simple models, one by Abraham Maslow and then another one by Clayton At Atifer. And, you know, this model, I, a lot of us have seen it before, and it's a hierarchical model, and it starts with physiological needs down at the bottom where we're concerned about our food, our housing, and our health, and that we need things that will t help us to take care of those needs. And see, you know, that's one of the things where we can all of a sudden say, hey, I see a service project in the making. But when you're thinking about the service project, and you think about the needs, you have to think about the emotional human being and how that particular service project would actually serve that human being so that we can have a, a positive effect on their lives. And hopefully, we can begin to build a healthy relationship with that particular person or group of persons that we're serving. Safety needs when you're thinking about security. Hey, one of the things that we do quite often is uh, we serve people who are homeless, serve children, and homeless and, and uh, children, they are the people that are most impacted quite often by changes in the weather. Like one time I did a service project along with Charlie Minnick, uh, we went down to Washington, Illinois. A whole neighborhood was wiped out by a tornado in the middle of winter, basically. And at that time, we needed to go down and clean up uh, what was left of housing debris and carry it all out to the streets. And we met a, a lady who had her house wiped out and she just had a few things in her hands. What was great about it was uh, Charlie was able to present the lady with a check to lighten her burden. And she began to cry right then and there. And see, that was a meaningful relationship. And even if we don't ever see the person again in life, we have a memory, a shared experience with her that becomes meaningful. And then you have esteem needs. Um, when you think about feeling good about being alive and you can tie that also right into social needs of building meaningful relationships. And also when you think about self-actualization needs, living the ultimate life, experiencing success. But Maslow, he said that we had to start at the bottom of the pyramid first that we're not going to get to the top of the pyramid unless we first take care of those lower level needs. And then as each lower level need is, is taken care of, the person is able to excel in life. And so when you're thinking about your service projects, you have to ask yourself, okay, what needs are you targeting? And remember, you need to tie in the emotions that come along with those needs. And so in doing so, how are those needs related to the emotions? Uh, two simple and basic questions that you can ask yourself as you think about your service project and what you're able to do out in society with people. So another thing that I want to bring up is uh, Clayton Anifer's uh, existence needs related to needs and growth needs uh, model that he used, which is a simplified model of uh, Maslow's model of hi hierarchy of needs. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Adifer said it was basically that, you know, as we try to fulfill our needs, that as we're moving through life, if anything happens, that we're not able to take care of some of the more important needs, we, re we experience frustration and we fall backwards. So our relationships don't work as well when we're hungry. 
Our relationships don't work as well when we're homeless. Our relationships don't work as well when we can't pay our, our, our rent for the month or for a couple months because we're more worried about our existence needs than we are about our relationship needs. And so when you think about that frustration that can be built into the people who are waiting in long lines just to get a, a, a bag of groceries handed out to them, you know, you can see those things happening with the people. And I've heard it before in service projects where some people say, man, they were really unthankful. Actually, they were really frustrated. And sometimes frustration takes us beyond being able to think about saying thank you. And so when we're in a better position in life and we're participating in a service project, we're able to, because we're becoming more emotionally uh, stable, emotionally mature, be able to think and manage our own emotions so that we don't respond in a negative fashion in a day long service project. So think about regression, frustration. Well, Here's some other things to think about. When developing any service project, think about how it will impact the needs and emotions of the persons or person being served. Now, recently, uh, I was in a service project over in Pretoria, South Africa. And all it was was getting thousands of books and boxing them up so that they could be shipped to outer communities. Well, if you look at that, you know, about how many books were collected and how many boxes were filled, then you could have um, met those particular goals. But the rest of the story is, is that, hey, those boxes were full of books that were being shipped out to villages uh, where people needed to learn math, people needed to learn how to read, people needed to expand their knowledge base because they had high amounts of unemployment, high amounts of illiteracy, high amounts of unemployment. And so when you think about what it feels like to feel helpless, what it feels like not knowing what the next thing that you can do in life to uh, get yourself a meal or a place to stay, then you think about the emotions that are uh, associated with those conditions when those are unmet needs. And then you think about the books and a long-term goal of helping the people to become self-sufficient. Then you see needs and emotions starting to be very, very important and that you now are focusing on the person or persons who are to be served. So the next thing that I want to say to you is like, serve the person more than the goal. Yeah, we can get, like I have some certificates from uh, at least two different presidents for having put in 100 hours in a year and serving that way. And it was neat to have the certificate. But what was more important was what was happening with the people who were being served. Like in the upper right-hand corner of my slide, uh, those are children from Kamundo, uh, Kenya. Some of them were homeless, uh, some of them were parentless, and uh, some of them, when they came uh, to be at this shelter that we were taking care of, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have their food, they didn't have safety, because truckers would come through and abuse the, abuse the kids, abuse them physically, abuse them sexually. But when this one uh, fellow named Joshua Gao was, uh, built a compound, one of the things he was doing was gathering money and through gathering the money, he was applying the money directly to the children, $30 a month. That's all that was needed. Well, our students actually gathered the money together, have a bunch of kids sponsored and even the sisters of St. Francis were able to kick in. And right now they continue that same service project by sewing clothing for the children. And this particular instance, one of the things with this uh, service project that was so important was that parents would show up with their children naked because they didn't have clothing, didn't have shoes. And when they would get there, they were given clothing. And see, we don't think about that in America, our children walking around naked because they don't know about how to uh, come by clothes. But this particular service project served that need. So when you're thinking about the person more than the goal, then you can 
internalize what's going on with the person. And that should give you even that much more energy for thinking about, hey, maybe I wanna do this same service project again and again and again. So another thing that you can consider distance members to tailor the service project to the need in their area. And so instead of having one general service project and trying to spread that out across the United States because you know like we're an online school, um, the people that get involved in it, and we do this through uh, uh, Golden Key and our chapters, we allow each of the people to tailor this service project. And then we su support that because they know best about what's happening in their area. And then the fourth thing, Build relationships with those you are serving. Now, this is very, very important. If you want to see lives changed, you got to be patient enough to get involved in that life. Now, yesterday, I, I want to give you one last example. It was my own personal service project, and it was brought on by a situation in the moment. I was going into a grocery store, and a mother got upset with her little two-year-old child. And she ha actually had two of them there with her. The little boy wasn't cooperating with his mother. Uh, matter of fact, he was upset. And he was trying to get to the door. You know what the problem was? The little boy was waiting for his grandmother to come in from the parking lot. The mother uh, proceeded to drag the little boy away from the door and along uh, on the floor and he was trying to get back to his grandmother and all of a sudden he started crying and he was crying uncontrollably. I walked up to the lady and the grandmother came in and she stood by me and I said, do you mind if I give your son and daughter a gift? And she just looked at me for a moment and then she said, sure, go ahead. And so I gave the little boy $2 and I gave the little girl $2. The little boy was still crying and I put my hand on his head. I said, you're such a wonderful little boy. Everything is going to be all right. And I looked into his eyes and, I, you know, it was just that moment to have that one time relationship. Well, actually, his mother saw what I did and his grandmother saw what I did. And maybe that will affect how they parent and how they raise those two children. And maybe they'll remember, instead of me judging them in the situation, I sought to help them in the situation. I'm really hoping that when I go to that grocery store in the future, I get at least one more chance to see them again. Because after all, that's what service projects are really about. If you wanna test the success of your service projects that you put together, see how the lives are impacted and see how the relationships flourish as you repeat the same service project, going back to the same organization, dealing with the same group of people. So at this time, uh, that does end my uh, presentation. And if you have a question for me, I'd be more than happy to take it. Dr. Woods, in the chat, there's just some comments about the um, statement that you made earlier um, that, you know, it's best to choose to um, serve the person and, and not the goal. And maybe you can expound on that a little bit more. Um, you've done several service projects. You mentioned your African trip and you've done a bunch of things in the community, but, you know, you're the one that sees the people that are benefiting from um, the outreaches that you make. So maybe you can expound on that a little bit for us. Okay, let's go ahead and look at uh, this slide. And thank you, whoever asked that question. Let's look at the students down in the left-hand corner. Uh, what those students did was uh, they were able to gather up a thousand pounds of rice. Uh, people were giving them money, and then they would take the money and go to Walmart and buy those bags of rice. And um, it was neat that they were able to get the thousand pounds of rice because that was actually the goal I set for them and they met and actually exceeded the goal. But the thing that was actually happening was we were in uh, the second poorest county in the uh, state of Iowa. And so they have 
more unemployment than uh, at when we look at the county, there's 99 counties and they had more unemployment than a 90, at least 97 other counties. And they had the homeless shelter there, the Victory Center. And you know, one of the things that the Victory Center needed was like items to be able to uh, make meals with. And it, you know, it was a, easier to make meals when you would have rice and then, or you would have the same type of meat instead of a lot of cans of food. And so I, I set that goal for them. But then as we went along and interacted with the Victory Center, they were telling us how effective that was going to be in the lives of the people that they were feeding because they had the homeless, they had, they had the people who were unemployed and who stop in for meals each and every day. And so then that was very helpful to those people. You know, children learn better when they have full stomachs than they do when they have empty stomachs. Man, it's comforting to go to bed when you're when your stomach has been filled, then going to bed on an empty stomach. And so when you concentrate on like, what is this thousand pounds really going to do in the lives of other people? Then that keeps the human perspective in the service project instead of just having met the goal, being happy and then going on your way. And so in each and every project, we are impacting lives. And we need to consider those things. And that's why it's really important to try and meet the people sometimes that you are serving so that you keep that perspective in there. And one of the things that it also does is it helps you to overcome any bias that you have. You know, one of the questions I've been asked in the past is like when people were begging uh, for money or begging for food, and it's like, what? a lot of those people they're just gonna take in that, that money or food and they're gonna either sell it or they're going to uh, go get alcohol with the money. And I said, I don't care about that. I did the right thing in giving to that person. And that person can remember that somebody did the right thing in their life. And so you serve the person and not the goal. Even though goals are helpful, use both things together if you need to. So that's my answer. Good points, Dr. Woods. I appreciate your input. Um, and I want to thank you um, for your wonderful presentation. Um, you're also an outstanding ambassador, um, not only in our country, but in other countries. And um, you serve many people, and uh, we're all very appreciative of that. So thank you again. Um, thank you for sharing. And thank you to all the participants for attending. And I wish you uh, would find some other presentations to also attend. Uh, tomorrow's our last day, so there's um, some more exciting things ahead. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And thank you, everyone. It was great to have you here today. Have a good afternoon.